Hello, my name's James Wright. I'm a third year PhD student at Queen Mary University of London, working with my supervisor, Dr Ewan Lane. My project is based around the synthesis of protein building blocks in order to make protein nanostructures. Today, I'll be going through some of the techniques I use in order to achieve this, including bacterial transformation, bacterial protein expression, protein purification using nickel ion chromatography, and finally, analyzing the proteins produced using SDS page gel electrophoresis. Here I have a plasmid that I'm going to transform into my protein production strain C41. Plasmids are circular pieces of DNA which we use to transfer the instructions for the synthesis of our protein into a bacterial cell. The plasmid contains at least three domains. These encode antibiotic resistance, an inducible promoter, and our protein of interest. The antibiotic resistant allows us to select for bacteria carrying our plasmid, and the inducible promoter allows us to choose when our protein of interest is expressed. The plasmid will be transformed into our production strain using electroporation. This is an aliquot of electrocompetent C41 cells. I've already mixed my plasmid in. We're going to put these in the electroporator and pass a high voltage electric current through the cells, creating transient holes in the cell wall. This will allow the plasmid to move into the cell and to be taken up. We'll then select for the cells containing our plasmid and use them to express our protein. We took cells from the plate and put them into our starter culture and let them to grow overnight. Now they've grown to a high cell density, meaning we're able to inoculate our growth media using a starter culture. We do this under aseptic techniques to prevent any contamination of the media. I'm going to use 20 mils of starter culture to inoculate one liter. This means we'll get to a good optical density of cells when we're ready to express our protein. Now we take our cells and put them at 37 degrees at 200 RPM shaking to make sure we get enough oxygen into the media to grow the cells to a high cell density. I've now taken the cells back to the 37 degree room. Now as you can see, the cell density has increased. This is the point at which I will add my IPTG to induce the expression of my protein. I will then take the cells back to the 37 degree room to heat and to grow for another three hours to produce my protein. Now you can see our cells have grown to an even higher density and hopefully produce lots of our protein. We need to separate the cells from the spent media in order to purify our protein. We do this by using centrifugation. So we'll just carefully pour the cells into the tubes and repeat until we run out of cells. Now we'll take the tubes to centrifuge and spin them to pellet the cells. So now we have a pellet of cells and protein and a supernatant containing the spent media. We need to pour off the spent media and retain the cells in the pellet with our protein so that we can purify it later. We do this carefully to avoid disturbing the pellet. We're going to resuspend the pellet using a buffer. Now we've resuspended all of the cells and we're going to snap freeze it in liquid nitrogen to lyse open the cells and break our protein away from the cells. We have snap frozen cells and protein hopefully starting to burst open the cells. We need to thaw this so that we can go to the next stage of lysis, sonication. Our cells are thawed out after being frozen in liquid nitrogen. We need to further lyse the cells by using sonication. We do this in a glass beaker to ensure that the heat created by sonication is properly distributed and our proteins don't get degraded by the heat. So I'm gonna put the glass beaker into a beaker of ice and we'll take it to the sonicating probe. After sonication, we need to separate cells from our protein that's hopefully still in the solution. We can use the centrifuge again for this, but because the densities of the protein and the cell debris are more similar, we have to spin at a higher speed to make sure we separate them properly. I'm going to spin in these centrifuge tubes. Now it's very important to balance these carefully. Now I'm going to take the centrifuge tubes and place them opposite each other in the centrifuge. Now we're going to secure the centrifuge lid. Now the centrifuge is finished, we have a nice separation of the cell, debris and pellet and our protein hopefully soluble in solution. I need to pour off this supernatant so we can run it down the column. Using this dialysis tubing, we're going to load the supernatant onto the column and bind our protein 
to the nickel resin. Our protein is going to bind to the nickel resin because it contains the histidine tag I've encoded when making the protein. See, now the supinate has run into the column and the column has changed color as the protein is bound to it. We've collected any flow through, so any protein that's not bound to the column goes straight through. We also need to wash off any protein that's just sort of sat on the column rather than specifically bound. We do that using the column wash buffer, which contains some salts and some buffering agents to keep the proteins in solution. We'll collect a little bit more of the flow through just to make sure nothing's left behind and then switch to our waste beaker. The wash buffer has come through the column, is now completely washed, removing any non-specifically bound protein from the column. So all that's left is our protein bound to the nickel resin. We need to elute it off the nickel resin. We do this using our elution buffer. Now the elution buffer is the same as the wash buffer, but it contains 250 millimolar of imidazole. Now imidazole displaces the hist tag from the nickel, allowing our protein to flow off the column. Now we want to capture the protein as it comes off the column. Can we do this in these tubes? Now we need to analyze the protein we produced using SDS page gel electrophoresis. Firstly, we need to boil the samples with SDS and loading dye. This dye is mixed with SDS, DTT, glycerol, and bromophenol blue. The DTT will break any double cysteine bonds formed by the proteins, helping them to relax and unwind the structures. SDS will coat the structures in a nice, even negative charge. This unfolds the protein to allow us to analyze them by size rather than by charge. To aid the denaturation, we're going to heat the samples at 98 degrees for 10 minutes. To make the SDS gel tank unit, we need to add running buffer to the tank. This allows the current to move from the inside of the cassette through the gel down to the outside. Now the first thing we're going to load onto the gel is the protein ladder. This contains a pre-prepared mixture of proteins at specific sizes to allow us to check what size our protein is running at. The next sample we're going to load is the pre-sample. This is taken before we induced our protein, so it should be telling us exactly what proteins the E. coli was producing before we induced ours. Now we're going to load the post-sample. This sample was taken at three hours after we induced, so hopefully we should see a band where our protein is present. The next sample we're going to load is the pellet. So this is the insoluble protein that shouldn't contain our sample, hopefully. Now we're going to load the supernatant. So this is the soluble part of the protein fraction. Hopefully our protein is in here. The next sample is the flow through. So this is any protein that did not bind to our nickel column. This should contain all the proteins the E. coli was expressing because they don't have his tag on them, and therefore can't bind to the nickel column. Now the final sample is our elution. So this will be when we added the imidazole and eluted our protein. So hopefully only our protein should be present. Now that all our samples are loaded, we put the lid on the tank and set it to run 180 volts for 60 minutes. So now the gel is finished running, we're going to stain the gel so that we can see our protein. First we open the tank, take the gel out. Remove the gel from between the glass panes and place it carefully into our staining box. Then into the staining box, we add our staining solution. This contains Kumasi dye, which binds non-specifically at first, but then to the protein which is present in the gel. Now the gel has been stained for an hour or two, we need to remove the excess staining solution and destain the parts of the gel that do not contain any protein. To do this, we add the destain solution, which does not contain any Kumasi, it's just methanol and acetic acid. We add the destain solution and incubate it for another couple of hours to destain the gel. So the destain is now finished and we can now look at our, what we can see on our gel. Here we have the ladder. If we look in the next lane, we see the pre-IPTG sample. So this is before induction of the expression of our protein. This shows you all of the proteins that E. coli is producing. The next lane shows the post-induction sample. So this shows the expression of proteins after the addition of IPTG to our culture. And as you can see, we have a nice band at about 30 kilodons corresponding to our protein. And the next lane, which is a sample from the pellet after lysis. The next lane shows the supernatant after lysing the cells. 
The lane after that is the flow through, and this flow through shows you everything that has gone straight through the column. The last lane here is the elution. This is a nice big band of elution of our protein at about 30 kilodons. So today I've shown you bacterial transformation by electroporation, bacterial protein expression, protein purification using nickel ion chromatography, and finally, SDS page gel electrophoresis to analyze the proteins produced. I hope you can use some of these techniques in your day-to-day -day experiments and you find this video useful.